Hello, hello. It's drum time. We've got a new camera angle today, and we've got a new backdrop as well. And we've got some sweet captions on the bottom, which we've included in our new game streams, but this will be the first time we have it in our drum streams too. So we'll make it... I mean, I know it's a music and a drum stream, but I you might as well have captions. So we're going to give it a moment, of course, as we always do, to get loaded up. I haven't warmed up yet, so we're going to do that here in just a second. Awesome. Per usual, we will check on the Twitch stream, make sure that everything is looking good before we start. And if you are already jumped into the chat, let me know if the audio sounds all right. We tried to boost it up a little bit since uh, we've had some issues with the drum stream being a little too quiet. Bingo, it looks like everything's all right. We're gonna pull this down just a little bit. Straighten the mic out. Sip of coffee again. All right, let's, uh, let's play some drums. Let's warm up. We're just gonna start with some eights and accent tap, get the hands moving. Uh, let me get a metronome, actually. What a great idea. Metronome. Gideon Johnston, not going to be able to stay for the stream, but hope you're having a good day, my guy. I definitely am. Thanks so much. Glad you at least hopped in to say hello. Perfect. Here we go. Here we go. I'm just going to get some eights. Get some eights to start. Got a good old message from Silver the Flame. Woo, drums with Zach. Oh yeah. Cool, we'll get some 12s now instead of 8s. Good shirt. I like the Remo shirts. They're all pretty comfy. They're all pretty comfy. Get a quick little molar accent in there.
Cool. Sweet deal. Hands are getting a little warmer. We'll play through some quick molar stuff, get the hands kind of moving with some, some fast singles, and then maybe we'll play a couple reps of Fulcrum Freddy before we move on to our exercises for the day. Here we go. Let's get some molar stuff. Move my... It's going to say older stuff because uh, it doesn't know what molar is. Not like a tooth molar. <sighs> Cool. We'll just do a basic blue coats type molar exercise. Cool. We'll do that same thing one more time. Ooh. Gotta lighten up the touch a little bit. Cool, cool, cool. Oh, I forgot the last pattern. The, uh... That's a hard one. That's actually the hardest one, I think. Ooh. So let's see, let's see. Let's do some Fulcrum Freddy real quick. This is an exercise that we've done in a previous stream. This comes from the Santa Clara Vanguard. Pretty cool. What's the last pattern? The last pattern is first partial accent, sixth partial accent. So you've got. Yep, so just fast. You feel the lull giving you back the, the hand transition. emphasis on that right hand to keep you on the downbeat the whole time. Also, as a bass drummer, I desperately need to work on my molar. Definitely. Yeah, it's one of those things where you should practice a lot of tap pyramid on a flat pad. Figuring out how to keep the cage that you have around the stick open and relaxed and twitchy, you know, not tense, but just flopping back and forth, uh, and then find a way to apply that when you don't have gravity to your advantage. And then once you have the tap pyramid feel in the hands, you have the wrist power necessary to add a little bit of molar stuff. Um, but I always go tap pyramid and then molar rather than molar and then tap pyramid. But yeah, let's play some Fulcrum Freddy. We'll slow it down again a little bit. That's pretty fast. Here we go. Let's do this one.
Yeah, that's a hard one. This is really fast. This is 106. So this is like testing your tap pyramid chops. Or I guess your understanding of how to move the stick lightly. But yeah, we'll try it a couple of times. This is a fun exercise, especially at this tempo. Oh, I think I played that backwards. I did the singles the first time. Whoops. I'm supposed to do the roll the first time. One more rep. One more rep. And then we'll get to our variations for the day. Ooh, that t last one is tough. There we go, that was closer. Man. Hard exercise, hard exercise. I said power exercise, that's funny. All right, so for today, we're looking at some 16th note timing variations. We're just gonna start with like really basic 16th note timing, the version that everybody knows. So this is actually a great tempo for this. We're just gonna start with something as simple as Four different patterns, first pattern being 1E e and 2E e and. Grayson Griffey, how are you doing? Good to see you. So that's our first pattern, just playing the A pattern, those four counts. We'll get like two reps on it, and then we'll add the next one on. I'm going to take this hoodie off. So this is something you've already played before. You'll feel that consistent eighth note in the right hand. As we fill all those left hand 16th notes in. Next pattern, bar two, it's going to be right, right, left, right, right, left, right. One and a two and a three. So we get a couple reps on just that bar. Let's go back and let's put them both together. One more time. Sweet deal. We got the next pattern, th third bar. We just have right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left, left, right, left. Or one E, a two E, a three E, a four E. 
So quickly, two reps on that bar. One more time. Cool, our very, very last bar, we take out the downbeat. We just have E and a, E and a, E and a, E and a downbeat. Our stock last pattern where we just don't play the first partial. So it sounds like. So I'll give you a tap, we'll get two reps on it. That was three, but I think you got it. Let's go back to the top and play all four bars together. One more time. One E and two E and one and a one E a E and a. Cool. So we have that base where we just played four counts of those four different patterns. Each bar is four counts long. What we're gonna do is we're gonna play the twos real quick. Where we just take those same four patterns, we cut them in half. They're two beats each. So now we have two of these. We have two of the next one. We have two of the third one. And we have two of the last one. And then it repeats, so we can make it as long as the fours. So we're gonna play just the twos with the repeat, and we'll get a couple of reps on it. Just the twos. And then obviously we're moving downwards and downwards and getting smaller in our progression. So we're gonna have the ones next. So we have one of these, one of these, one of these, and one of these. And so we're gonna put them all back to back. Do the repeat four times. It'll sound something like this. Right, so we're gonna go back to the top now and we're gonna play all the way through. We're just gonna get it one time and then we're gonna do some fun stuff with this basic 16th note timing pattern. One rep all the way through, fours, twos, and ones. One, two, ready, go. Twos. Cool. So, if you've been playing drums for more than a couple of years in high school, you've probably already learned that exercise before and played through that bass pattern. What we're going to do with it is superimpose a new sticking on top of it. And what I mean by that is normally when we play this, we have four available slots for each 16th note partial. We have the first, the second, the third, and the fourth. So what we're doing is we're removing one of those partials for every single pattern. But what we're assuming by playing the sticking the way that we are now is that every single note is always notated with a right hand, left hand, right hand, left hand. So the first pattern that we played is right, left, right, rest on the left, right, left, right, right, left, right, right, left, right. The next pattern, right, we skip the second partial, that left, and we go right back to the right hand again, right, right, left, right, right, left, right. So what we're doing now with this bass pattern is instead of playing as if the sticking was right, left, right, left the entire time, we're going to play the same timing exercise with the sticking of a paradiddle. So right, left, right, right, 
and then left, right, left, left on the next beat. So what this does is it doesn't change anything about the rhythms that we're playing. It just changes the order of the notes on each hand and forces us to play a different sticking pattern over the top of the same thing. And we're not going to put the accent on the paradiddle. It's still all going to be at one bass height. So what we're going to do, Ray Melanda, hello. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to YouTube. We are going to just start with the first patterns that we talked about a second ago in the fours. We're just going to play the first pattern, right? Originally, the sticking was right, left, right. Now, if we think about the paradiddle, we have right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, left one. So the first pattern changes from being a right hand lead every single grouping to now switching from right hand lead to left hand lead. So now we've got. And so now we have to control that float a little bit more, just makes us think about something different. The next pattern was just one and a two and a three and a four and a one. So now we're thinking about how that aligns with the paradiddle sticking, which is the first note of the paradiddle and then the double to finish the paradiddle. So those are your two patterns for the beginning. time. Cool. We have our third pattern again, which when we were doing straight sticking for this was that strong left hand keeping you on the upbeat the whole time. Now we're thinking about the paradiddle again, right? We would have right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. And so we are once again straight sticking but now with this new bass rhythm than what we had played it when we had the normal straight sticking exercise. So very similar to your first pattern, but slightly different. Our last pattern is just the E and in the uh, the second, the third, and the fourth partial. And so if we're thinking about the paradiddle, that just means we don't play the downbeat of the paradiddle. We start right on the taps. So the right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. And so we have this inverted diddle or putted us sticking. And so the last pattern. And so if we go back a pattern and play the third and the fourth together with this new paradiddle bass, it looks something like this. Whoops. And I play that sticking wrong. We'll do it one more time. Which is kind of strange because you have to come in off that left put it up because you start always with a right hand paradiddle. So you start on the second partial of that left hand. Very strange. So if we go back to the beginning, right, we have four patterns now that are all the exact same. The rhythms should still sound like. But now instead of the base of a normal four note grouping of straight sticking 16th notes, we have a four note grouping of paradiddle 16th notes. And so now the whole exercise looks like this in the fours. We had a couple of times off tap. Whoops, I played that wrong. One more time. And with this new bass sticking, we can, just like we did in the straight sticking version, take it into the twos and take it into the ones. And so now if we just did two groupings of each, 
with the repeat. We have to go from that last pa -da -da back into the rhythm that we're expecting. So let's go ahead and try just the twos by itself. that a couple of times. Kind of funky. One more, one more. Cool. So that's the twos. We also have the ones. So if we tried to play the ones, we have to also think about which handed paradiddle we're playing. Is it a right hand paradiddle in the bass right now? Or is it a left hand paradiddle? Because every single beat, it changes from right hand lead to left hand lead because of the nature of the paradiddle. So in the ones, we have to be aware of that. We start with right, left, right, right. We have our next rhythm now, which is one and a comes after that. So right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left. That's a lot of lefts. Our next downbeat comes in, we have one E, uh, but with the paradiddle sticking, it's the third beat, so it's off the right hand. So we have right, left, right. So, so far, we are starting in the ones with, and then we have a left hand paradiddle on beat four. We're only playing the last three partials of it, and so that means we play right, left, left, one, to put us right back on the right hand. And so the ones should sound like, And it's kind of strange to play that beat two off of all the left hand, but that's exactly what you would do if you were playing a paradiddle off the left hand on beat two. So let's go ahead and just try the ones with the four repeats, and then we'll go back and see if we can do it all the way through with a superimposed paradiddle instead of with the superimposed straight sticking group. Still just the ones. Gross stick click. Get that two or three times. Awesome. So now that we understand that, we're going to go back to the top. We're going to play the whole 4-2-1 of 16th note timing, the bass way that we know how to play it, the right rhythms. But we're going to play the paradiddle sticking all the way through. And that's it, all the way through. Paradiddle 16th note timing. We get it one more time. Whoops, I messed that up. And so it's just an easy way to take a basic exercise that you may already know and be very comfortable with in terms of the rhythms and the math and its relationship to the metronome and make it tricky all of a sudden.
to give yourself something else to think about, add a new layer to the basic exercise that forces you to try a little bit harder, to be a little bit smarter. So let's go ahead and do the same thing, but let's put the accent into that superimposed paradiddle. So we're still playing the same exercise, but we're treating it as if the bass rhythm underneath everything is this. Where a second ago, it was this. But still the same length of exercise. We'll take just the fours real quick to make sure that we are comfortable. So something like... Right, and because we don't play the downbeat on pattern four, we just play all taps there. So play the fours a couple of times to get comfortable with it. Cool, so you gotta be ready to kind of stop the stick on that last upbeat, that final uh, and then start those paradas off the left hand when you get to pattern four. A lot of people find that a little bit strange feeling. Let's play just the twos, right? So same grouping, same way, cut it in half. Look at that one more. Cool, and so we have the same thing, but for the ones, where it's probably something like... Yep, and we play right hand parada, back into that hand transition. Right hand parlor is what it says. And then a Paula, that's funny. I love watching the captions try to figure out proper drum speak. Here we go. Just the ones. Perfect. So that's the ones with the superimposed paradiddle sticking with the accent. We're going to go back to the beginning and try to take the whole 4 2 one. I'm going to move these real quick. Perfect. Here we go. All the way through the 4 2 one straight paradiddle. Nice, not too shabby, that was pretty good. We'll do that one more time, and then we're gonna try to connect all of these back together. I need to close my window real quick because we have a dog upstairs. All right, all right. Here we go. We're going to play it one more time. Cool. And I think that one is really the easiest out of all of them for me. 
just because it naturally grooves with the accent and it becomes more memorable that way. The reason the block heights are harder in my brain is just because everything sounds the same. It's a different rhythm, but the volume of every note doesn't change. The added layer actually helps me think about it a little bit, which is different and weird. Usually added layers don't help you think. All right, so what we're gonna do is try to connect all three of those together. We have normal 16th note timing with straight sticking, four, two, one, into paradiddle sticking, four, two, one, into paradiddle sticking, including the accent, whole four, two, one. So that's a lot of stuff back to back. We're just gonna try it once or twice, and then we're gonna move on to our stick control stuff. But I think these are some great initial variations to be playing. That will help out a lot. All right, all right. Why'd my TV turn off? TV! <clears throat> turn back on. I think my computer got sleepy. That's fine. Ah, there it is. Here we go. All three 4 2 1 patterns back to back. accent. Whoops. Nice. So that's not too bad, actually. We got all the way through it the first time. We had a nasty stick click on the beginning of rep three, but I'll dismiss it. I think that's good for now. So those are some great ways to just add another layer to stick control, sorry, not stick control, stick timing, 16th note timing or triplet timing. Just layer another bass sticking pattern over the top of it. Pick a different order for those four notes that you're trying to make different patterns out of, and it's gonna do a lot for your hands. You can move the accent wherever you want, and that's going to further confuse your hands. We can do paradiddles in the same timing exercise with an accent on the second partial. And so it turns into something like... Which is a really funky and weird pattern that makes your brain think a lot. And that's definitely one way that you can take a basic exercise and push yourself a little bit further with it than you normally would playing that exercise. We're gonna go into some stick control stuff now. And by stick control, I mean a basic four, two, one exercise that has four patterns very similar to what we just did with timing. So what we're gonna do is turn the men on the same tempo. We're gonna have four patterns that you're probably familiar with, right? Just stuff like right, 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 left. As a 16th note grouping. We'll say pattern two is right, left, left, left. Another very familiar one for most of us. We'll do fours for the third one. And then doubles for the last one. So there's four patterns, all the exact same rhythm. The intention is to bounce the stick smoothly and comfortably from every single height. Or if you do downstroke, make sure that it doesn't change the quality of sound. Make sure that you have that smooth 16th note feel to the hand all the way through. So we'll just play the fours with those four patterns.
sekte ya kan One more time, one more time So as we play through this, we also have the twos and the ones where we just cut down the groupings. I'm going to go ahead and play the twos and the ones together so you can just hear the rest of the exercise. that one more time and then we'll check out the chat Cool. So that is the twos and the ones of the normal stick control patterns that we would play in 16th notes. We'll go back to the beginning and play the whole 4-2-1 here in a second. Grayson has a couple questions, though, and I want to read through them really fast. So, kind of a lengthy question. Whoops, I'll turn the med off. Kind of a lengthy question when you get a chance. How do you balance simpler exercises slash grids with more long-term stuff, licks slash learning music, in lessons? How do you balance simpler exercises with grids and more long-term stuff? Okay. I've been trying to assign some more long-term stuff, learning harder slash longer exercises and show music to my students lately because I know so few of them are doing any ensembles, aka nothing to look forward to long-term in terms of drumming progress. So for me in my lessons, I think it's a little bit simpler because most of the lessons that I teach are my own high school students. Um, they are participating in a performing ensemble, and so there are pieces of show music that I can already kind of give them. So generally, my scheme is simple in that I can prioritize a couple skill sets that I feel like they really, really need for the particular show music that I want to give them. And as we do lessons, I'm evaluating just their understanding of the skill set, and that doesn't even mean the way that they play through the skill set only it's also the way that they speak about the skill set and it's the way that they respond to me with dialogue when we talk about the skill set that shows me whether they actually understand it or whether they can sort of get their hands to fumble through it often and when i feel like the students are at a point to where they understand the skill set that i'm trying to teach them and they can have a conversation about it you know they can speak the language that i'm trying to deliver to them uh, and talk about why they're playing in a certain way, or why they may want to play it a different way, then I can start to give them denser pieces of music that apply that skill set directly. And we can start to talk about how the skill set that they just worked on and the information that they got applies to that music and context. So for me, it's a very step-by-step, -step, very, very clear process of identify the skill sets, talk about why these are more of a priority, make sure that through the lessons we play basic exercises and identify how to talk about those skill sets or identify certain problems and things that they should maybe do or shouldn't do and then finally moving into a more particular like hey this is what we're going to ask you to do within this piece of music or within this production or in your performance how can we take the information that we've now talked about and had discussions about and work through simple and complicated exercises on and actually put it into practice into what we're doing. And I think the biggest thing is like, can the students speak the language back to you? You know, have you taught it to them in lessons to a point to where they can actually converse with you about it and share dialogue about what may be right or what may be wrong? And if they have a good idea of what to look for and they can have those conversations and actually put words into their head about those skill sets, then generally they do a good job of achieving those things. So the balance for me is just, you know, the normal process. So let's say, mm, yeah, I usually do a similar thing. I pick a skill set to work on, 
then come up with some basic stuff to build it up, then put it in context. It's tricky with nothing coming up, which is the case for all of my students when it comes to planning lessons week to week. So I would say a way that you may be able to direct that more efficiently to give yourself more of a structure to why to what skill sets you're trying to teach them and why um, is to you know think about what your general approach is and how you prioritize your skill set list you know i think every ensemble across the united states when it comes to drums uh, abides and thinks about the same list of skill sets that they need to have and what gives them their definitive approach or the way that they look or move their hands is just ordering those skill sets differently you have groups like Santa Clara Vanguard, which clearly prioritize balance and blend. You have groups like, um, I don't know, Atlanta Quest, where we may more rigidly define our height structure or something like that, where it, there may be more visual definitions and balance and blend may not be as high on that. And so for you, it's about like, you know, figuring out what you prioritize and why, you know, what's at the top of the list. You know, from there, you can direct those skill sets to your students, you know, make sure that they have the most important things uh, in your eyes. Uh, highlighted and figured out and then the less important things and then finally how they kind of move into that more difficult stuff but yeah that's all really great stuff i love talking about just uh teaching philosophy and the uh the vernacular we decide to use when talking to kids or talking to students in particular not always kids well yeah cool we're gonna go back we're gonna play the uh we're gonna play the four two one with the stick control patterns. We're going to review it really quickly, and then we're going to go through and play one other version of stick control that just makes us, once again, add a new layer to it, think about it differently, and may confuse the hands a little bit. So here we go. I could talk about teaching all day. Absolutely. It's so easy. There's so much stuff. Drums are so undefined that there's so many ways to go about it, and so... Picking your way is definitely a, an easy way to define your structure. Here we go, full 4 two, one of stick control. Cool, we'll get one more of those reps, one more of those, just so we could work through the pattern. Cool, we've done it. So what we're going to do now is just play the same kind of idea. We're working on stick control. We're working on playing different stickings over the same bass rhythm for an entire exercise and getting an even transition of hands. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna slow the tempo down a little bit and we're gonna put this in groupings of five. And so now we're thinking about the five lit as the bass instead of the 16th note. And so now we're going to have a couple of sticking patterns that fit over this. We're going to find four patterns, just like we did when we were playing the 16th note, 4 two, one So the first pattern is going to be 3-2, three, 3-2, two, three, two, three, two, three, two. So if this was the rhythm, the new sticking is... Second pattern is going to be 2-3, 2-3. So play just those back to back, four counts of each. Whoops. It's hard.
cool, not too shabby. Interesting, I wonder why it's not clearing the captions when I'm silent for a couple of seconds. Quick check. All right, we started and stopped. If we don't say anything for two seconds. Hey, okay, it's good. Cool, so those are our first two patterns, three, two and then two, three. What we're gonna do for the third and the fourth pattern is four, one, and then one, four. So now in the same fivelet, we got four, one. And we're trying to keep this relatively even volume all the way across. And then one, four. Little slow on that. So let's try both of those back to back four one and then one four. Whoops. And I think for me it's easier when I can play all of them back to back because I really get to hold on to that five-lit feeling when I have to do it randomly out of the blue. I'm generally less accurate. Cool. So let's go back to the top and play those four patterns. We have three, two, two, three, four, one, one, four. Whoops. Gosh, dang it. There we go. Get two more. Last one. Cool. So it's like a fun little math game to play with play with yourself. We're gonna do the same thing for the twos and the ones just so we can work through it and get all the way through the four two one exercise. So if we have the twos, we now have two of the three twos, two of the two threes, whoops, two of the four ones, and then one fours. Chicken Nuggers, welcome to the stream. Good to have you, good to have you. Here we go, just the twos now. We're gonna try to play them back to back with the repeat, all four of those patterns. Almost, that was really close. This is a tough one. Oh, I'm playing the twos, not the fours. Two more times. Last time, last time. My phone buzzed and it took me out of the moment. <laughs> it was hilarious. Sweet deal. Let's uh, 
Look at the ones really quickly. We have one of the three twos, one of the two threes, one of the four ones, and then one of the one fours. And then we repeat that four times. So it's a lot of stuff. 16 iterations of a fivelet. So that's really strange. When you get to the ones, when you think about it in larger groupings, it goes from this really weird three double double three to a four single single four. Three double double three, four single single four. And so the movement and the flow of the hands is really, really strange trying to play through these. Because your hands wait longer in the three twos and then have a smaller and tighter transition in the four ones. Let's go ahead and just try the fours a couple of times. We'll work through it with, I don't know if we can get through all four repeats, but we'll try. Nope. Cool, we made it. We can do it. Oh no. And so I have to continue to think about them as all separate fivelets and four patterns. When I start to put them all into bigger patterns of two beats each, it becomes too large for me to really think about consistently. Too big of an idea. Cool. So that's the ones. Let's go back to the beginning. We're going to play the whole 4 2 1, or we're going to try to play the 5 lit 4 2 1 of stick control. Rather than a 16th note bass, now we've got a 5 lit bass. Four new patterns. Man, that's really tough. That's really tough. That's a good like mental exercise on something that's already pretty familiar to the hands. Let's do the same thing. Mm. Got to play good five lips first. All right, so overall, that's a really difficult pattern. Just keep consistent in the hands. That's something that I would suggest to everyone if I was giving that to a student to practice it at piano first. Just to get comfortable with the idea of keeping the feeling in the hand absolutely consistent and to just play the bass rhythm with the correct sticking pattern correctly. Doing it with the same wrist feel, the same finger touch to the stick, and then progressively bringing the heights up. But definitely a lot of stuff and a lot of weird motion for the hand. Trying to think about the way that it flows through three, two, two, three, and then three, and then four, one, one, four. Right? It's a big change in just the flow of the movement. And so it makes you think a lot.
But that's kind of the intention for today is to take two very basic exercises that most people would be familiar with. 16th note timing, very basic. And then superimpose a new sticking on it. Take another layer, right, the sticking pattern that's underlying everything and change it up. Do something weird with it. Play it backwards if you want to. Just do something that makes it a little bit strange for you and makes you think harder. Same thing with stick control. We took our normal 16th note stick control, our grouping of three, one, one, three, fours, doubles. And then we put it over a five lit base and we created some new patterns that made the flow of the hands work differently. And it works on the exact same skill sets as 16th note timing does or 16th note stick control does, but it makes you think harder and so it just kind of pushes you up to that next level. You know, it's like, can I do this at just an open class level? Or can I really apply this concept of even hand flow or good timing when I'm encountering an exercise that is built different? It's harder, right? It's definitely harder. But can I still do the same things that I normally would do on something like... Boom. Definitely good. Did you ever march with Corey Watkins? Some of the things you say remind me of him. I absolutely did. I absolutely did march with Corey Watkins. I haven't talked to Corey in a while. But yeah, that's definitely fun. Well, that's all I really have for today. We've done about an hour of good drums. Um, some things to be looking out for on the channel. We're probably going to have two YouTube uploads this week, not just one. I have a new video idea that I currently have written out and will be working on. So that's sick. If you're not following the Twitch, or subscribe to the YouTube, please do that. It helps my analytics so much, and it just makes me feel a little bit warmer inside when I know there's more people involved in the community. Within the next week, we're gonna be opening up a Discord server, so that way you can get a little bit more involved in what is going live each week, what content we're doing, um, and so we'll talk more about upcoming projects and some of the videos that we have uh, and some of the closing statements that we make, but otherwise, Follow the Twitch, subscribe to the YouTube, go to live.zacharwatson.com for all the social medias. I'm done drumming for the day. It was really good talking about, you know, teaching philosophy and stuff. Those are two really good exercises to be looking at or just ways to manipulate exercises, any exercise you can think of. If you have any questions, feel free to hit me up. I'm all over social media and I'm pretty much always active. So happy to answer. I'll see you guys later. Peace out.